Hello, YouTube. This is Mahadeva, the Thunder Wizard. All right, so I don't know what's in the air, but in all of my channels, I'm getting really weird comments. Must be something astrologically going on, but a lot of people wanting to pick fights with me and wanting to correct me, and, and some of my channels wanting to give me just crazy, inappropriate, unsolicited advice. But in this video, we're going to talk about the masculine and the feminine and the dynamic of the masculine and the feminine. So uh, I've made a few videos about this, and I have one video called The True Power of the Feminine, What is Shakti? And um, I make... I don't even remember exactly what I say in the video, but I'm quite certain that I say something along the lines that what the feminine wants to do, because bear in mind, the, the masculine and the feminine have this, this sort of magnetic attraction repulsion thing. And the dance of creation is the dance of the masculine and the feminine. And what the masculine needs is shakti because shakti the feminine is power and the uh, the masculine is strength so you have this dynamic balance between power and strength and in the vedic mythology what we have is we have the masculine left to itself the masculine uh, seeks to become one with the entire universe. Now we're talking about the spiritual masculine. So human being men and, you know, Shiva, there might be some difference. Shiva represents where masculinity wants to go when it's uh, released itself from the attachments of uh, this limited uh, reality that we live in. So what the masculine wants is the masculine wants union with infinity. And this is represented by Shiva sitting at the top of Mount Kailash uh, at, in the Himalayas. So that represents mountains are, they don't just represent, they actually are, extremely yang energy which represents heavenly spiritual energy which is yang. Which is masculine. The feminine represents the earth energy, the energy of manifestation. And so uh, this earth energy needs the masculine energy in order to create, because the desire of the feminine is to create in this physical world. But in order to do that, she must connect with the masculine so she longs for the masculine and so the feminine longs for the masculine and uh, that is represented with in the myths parvati seeking out shiva shiva is in the bliss of his self-awareness and nothing can shake him from that and parvati comes tries to wake him up. She does everything. She sits next to him and meditates. Nothing brings him out of his bliss of self connection to the, to the essence of the universe. So she calls upon the God of lust, the, you know, the Vedic equivalent of Cupid. And so Cupid does his work and fills Shiva with lust and he's awakened out of his his bliss and he's angry because he has been now brought down uh, to his baser instincts and he's very furious at that and he looks around and he sees the god of lust and he opens up his third eye and uh, kills him on the spot and that uh, distresses shakti Parvati is distressed by that, and she pleads with him, please forgive me, I brought him here because I have been fantasizing about you, 
and your, you know, my eternal love, please forgive me. Uh, bring, bring him back to life. I'm so sorry. And what then really enamors him with her is her love for creation, her uh, intense emotion uh, and her, des her honest desire uh, to preserve life. That then is what brings him into uh, a place where he wants to connect with her. And so that creates the dance of creation because then they merge and then they create the universe, etc., etc. So what I said in this video and I continue to say is uh, based on my experience of having had um, not only years of uh, experience with my spiritual practice, but also various levels of uh, romantic engagements, ones that have been destructive, ones that have been, you know, purely, you know, more on a superficial level, and then um, ones where I felt I was really being empowered by, truly empowered by Shakti. So what I say in this video is that what Shakti does for the masculine is that the feminine sees the masculine for what it can accomplish, what it can become. The feminine sees the masculine at its highest potential, and this is what turns her on. So a healthy woman, uh, if we're talking about masculine, feminine, uh, you know, um, normal, hetero, normal, sorry, heterosexual relationships, nobody get their panties in a bunch here. And if we're talking about heterosexual, masculine and feminine, the woman, if she's healthy, if she's individuated, if she's empowered within herself, she is going to see in her partner his highest potential. And this is what is going to turn her on the most, to see him become individuated and to see him become that. Now, when he looks at her and he sees reflected in her eyes, now bear in mind, we're talking about two people who are individuated, which means that they're not projecting onto each other. Uh, again, this is a, per a perfect ideal, and but we can achieve it. If he is individuated and he sees in her, reflected in her eyes, his highest ideal, this is going to inspire him and he will feel empowered just by being in her presence. And then he will seek to, to become that and he will do it because it turns her on. So she becomes an inspiration, but you know, it's, she's, she is appealing to his highest ego, if you will. But she, as the feminine, she will get her empowerment from seeing him achieve his greatest. Now, as he does that, of course, he is going to seek to connect with her more deeply and empower her creative essence, which is also, you know, so it, fuel, it ends up, they end up fueling each other. And they're both uh, work together towards reaching... Um, you know, reaching the spiritual union and enlightenment. And so then we get to the perfection of the masculine and feminine. So this person, um, I'm just going to, I mean, I found his response to be, it's, and listen, it's okay for people to disagree with me. I disagree with a lot of people. I kind of don't understand why you come onto my channel if you disagree with me. I kind of think, in my personal opinion, because I have a channel, and if I have something I want to say, I can go on to my channel and say it. I think needing to troll somebody's channel and write out, you know, big giant comments where you're going to put them in their place and tell them how wrong they are. I think that's rather pathetic for me, but I have a channel. I can, I can make my videos and I can get my opinion out there. So maybe I don't know what it's like. But again, uh, the, my experience of this is it's... it's um, you know, it's obviously somebody has a different opinion, but it also comes across 
um, it, it, it comes across demeaning. It comes across, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, it, it coming from, you know, very full of itself and I'm going to put you in your place and you don't know what the hell you're talking about. So instead of letting me know, hey, I have a different opinion of this, uh, this person just launches in and says, the true masculine is not looking to indulge the fantasies of a spaced out mind. And I, and I, and I have to try and figure out, where is that, what does that have to do with anything? You know, there's no reference, there's no context. And this sort of reflects somebody who is um, strongly emotionally reactive regardless of how they see it. Because, you know, one of the things the, that, that uh, YouTube does and the internet does, especially, you know, I make these long videos. So I say a bunch of things. And I go into a bunch of different tangents and subjects. And so, um, of course, you're going to respond immediately in the moment to something that's triggered you. And you, very often you will respond as though I'm sitting there with you and... We both know what the context is, and I don't. And so lots of times I go, you have to give me context. I don't know what you're talking about. This is a good example of that. Person says, the true masculine is not looking to indulge the fantasies of a spaced out mind. So somewhere in my, my diatribe, this person was stimulated and need to respond to that. I don't know what that means. <laughs> So I have to try and figure it out. I have to try and go, okay, this somebody's wrapped up in their impulses in the moment and they're having a, an intense feeling and they have to tell me how wrong I am. So since this video is about um, the masculine at some point wanting to meet the needs of the feminine as well as uh, vice versa. So he must say that I'm saying that the masculine is seeking to indulge the fantasies of a spaced out mind. So I don't know where that comes from, but it's very hostile. It's very, you know, it's very demeaning. Um, it's very grandiose. Um, so he goes on to say, he is not interested in what somebody thinks his potential might be. So he's enraged at the idea. He's enraged at, because, and he even like thinks, he even bolds the word, thinks. How dare you even think what my potential might be? I don't care what you think my potential is. So, I mean, this is enraging to him that somebody, a, a woman, would look at him and see his potential. Because I make the argument that the masculine needs the feminine in order to see their potential and rise to it. I mean, and again, all the, the same, you know, when I use the, that language, it also brings up exactly what happens during the act of lovemaking. The man rises to the potential. I mean, these, these are all, uh, you know, th these are all synchronicities that are there for a reason. It's exactly what happens. So he's, in, he's, he's, he's responding as though he's infuriated. I'm willing to bet he would say that he's not infuriated at all. But, you know, again, he's jumping into midstream and mid-sentence as though we're in the midst of a conversation. And he's being very uh, aggressive and grandiose and uh, condescending. The true, the true masculine is not looking to indulge the fantasies of a spaced out mind. Apparently that's what I'm saying. He's not interested in what somebody thinks his potential might be. He is already, all caps, uh, uh, italicized. He is already connected to the Shakti who expects nothing from him. So now he's made the leap from somebody be, a, a woman being inspired and empowered by what she sees in him. That's a difference between expecting something from somebody. Expecting something from somebody is, is a whole different codependent deal. And so the whole flavor of this comes across very codependent and very toxic to me. And um, I'll, I'll share it with you. But this has become a theme. I think codependence, I think maybe we need to talk more about what codependence is on this channel. What I'm sensing already from this is somebody who's actually, you know, because again, if... 
you know, methinks thou dost protest too much. You know, when somebody says, I am not that, I don't think that, I'm not, it's usually because that's exactly what's going on. So we can almost infer the exact opposite of what this person is struggling against within himself. So the true masculine is not looking to indulge the fantasies of a spaced out mind. That's referring to a selfish, self-centered woman. So he's saying, I'm not interested in giving to some selfish, self-centered woman. He is not interested in what somebody thinks his potential might be. So he's saying, I don't care what a woman thinks my potential might be. And then he's going to tell us why he doesn't need women, which that is, me thinks thou dost protest too much, it means he really needs women. And that need is so intense, it's painful. And it's also um, embarrassing. So he has to now put up the false facade of, I don't need anything or anybody. I am the almighty who gives out of my, right? I'm just telling you what I'm reading. I don't know this person. I only know this person has been stimulated and needs to now respond to me and take a, you know, an opposite uh, opinion in order to put me in my place. Because whatever I'm saying is angering him and threatening him on such a level that he needs to, you know, now aggressively and, um, you know, very self-righteously put me in my place. So he says uh, he is not the true masculine. He is not interested in what somebody thinks his potential might be. He is already connected to the Shakti who expects all caps nothing from him. And that Shakti is the true seed of masculine power. I agree with that last part. But, I mean, I never said anything about Shakti expecting anything from him. Uh, I never, never said anything about Shakti demands anything from masculine. So he's projecting onto this some really dysfunctional stuff that I haven't said which lets you know people respond from their experience. So I already know, even though this guy is going to try and tell me the opposite, that he's got some pretty serious codependent issues going on here. So what, does, what is codependence? Codependence, uh, there, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of misunderstanding. People get bent out of shape out of the word dependence. And, you know, if I say that's very codependent, they'll go, I'm not dependent on anybody. This guy is making that same... Uh, argument. He's not dependent on anybody, um, which usually means that he does feel dependent and he doesn't like it. So he responds with, you know, I don't have blah, blah, blah. Because, you know, um, what's wrong with saying uh, that you're dependent on something, anything? What's wrong with it? So he says, uh, so uh, I, I was going to tell you codependence. Codependence is when your worth or your value is based on what you do, not who you are. And so what I'm saying is that the feminine sees the masculine for who he is. He may not be aware of who he, he is yet. But when the feminine sees the masculine, we're talking the true feminine, when the true feminine sees the, the masculine, she sees him for who he really is, even if he doesn't see it yet. And she will reflect back to him without ne even necessarily telling him anything. He will see in her eyes. Her eyes will be filled with love, and in that love, he will see his highest potential. And the feminine will actually uh, empower him to achieve that. If she does talk to him, she will talk to him as though he is already there. And he will become aware, oh my God, I'm, I, I'm not even anywhere near what she's describing. But I really would like that. And so again, this guy has a real problem with the idea of a man being uh, inspired to become what this woman can see in him. And she's getting turned on by that. He's turning that around into she is now being grandiose and she is expecting him to be something. And I think you should do this, which is not what I said. 
So again, this tells me this has been his experience. So um, in other words, he has a he is he is he's he's exhibiting the signs of somebody who is in codependent denial. He's denying that he's codependent, and he is he's he wants to say that he has no. Um, he has no need for anything. He has no need for the for the feminine, and he certainly isn't vulnerable to anything. And nobody's going to tell him what to do or what to be, which is absolutely not what I said at all. I haven't said any of those things. This is his projection, based out of his response to his actual insecurity. So his actual insecurity is that he is controlled by the feminine that women do tell him what to do and what to be, which is not the true feminine. That's the negative feminine. That's, that's the disempowered feminine. So a woman that is not in her power, what she does is she criticizes and controls, which, you know, if you're a man, you've probably experienced that as well. One of the most damaging things that a woman can do is, um, you know, that look. You know, if you're a man, you know what I'm talking about. They, they look at you sideways and they... This is, by the way, what, what uh, threw Will Smith, you know, off the deep end. If you remember, Chris Rock was giving a, a really, actually, a positive joke empowering uh, Jada Smith Pinkett by... Uh, Jada Pinkett Smith by saying that, uh, you know, she was a powerful woman. And she took it the wrong way and she... She rolled her eyes, and uh, Will Smith was laughing. He got the joke. He was laughing at the joke, and then she gave him that sideways look, you know, that disapproving sideways look, and that's what, that's why he went up and smacked Chris Rock. And as we know, now it's all coming out how incredibly abusive and codependent that relationship is, especially coming from her. So... Um, what I'm seeing here is a guy who, at the very least, feels as if the feminine just... But that's the worst thing you can get from, from a woman that you care about. If she gives you that sideways look, and then they really do look you up and down. They, like, look at you. It's horrible. It's the worst thing uh, um, a, a man can experience. And... Um, I've done this experiment, uh, and I, if you, anybody, any teachers out there, like if, you have, if you're a yoga teacher or something like that, you can try this, exp this experiment. But it works every time. So what you do is you get like the nerdiest looking guy, and you bring him up. You know, somebody who isn't, you know, a, an alpha male, and you bring him up and you stand him up. And then you find the sexiest, hottest woman in the, in the class, and you bring her up. And you have her sit down on his left side on the ground and him standing there. And all she has to do, you have her put her uh, hand around his ankle. And then you muscle test him, you know, muscle testing where you put your arm out like this and you think of something. And if it's a disempowering thought, you'll, you know, your hand will go down. If, if you're empowered, you won't be able to move the person. So you uh, have him, you know, put his arm out. And then you whisper in, in the woman's ear to think that he is the most ridiculous, worthless man she's ever seen. And then you muscle test him. And you'll see he'll have no strength. Zero. He will have lost all of his strength. You whisper in her ear, he is the most amazing man she's ever met. She's just so turned on. And all she has to do is think that. And you will not be able to move his arm. That's how much power the feminine has over the masculine. This guy doesn't like that idea. Now, you guys know me. I am, I think, I think I represent um, what people would consider to be an alpha male type. You know me, I, I'm outspoken. I don't let anybody tell me what to do or what to think. And I'm sitting here telling you that I am a man. And I'm a heterosexual man, and even though I am working towards being spiritual, and um, I believe I'm doing a pretty good job of being individuated, I'm my own person. I, I make, you know, I think you guys might agree that that's kind of true. 
But if I'm interested in a woman, she can have that kind of power over me, at least um, temporarily. Of course, I'm not going to want to be with a woman that disempowers me. But the the you know any man, uh, unless he's yeah any man, if they're not honest about that, there's something wrong. And so we do live in a society of disempowered men. And we live in a society where men pretend to be something they're not. This is the whole, uh, you know, the whole dating advice that men get about, you know, be be an asshole and that's what men want and all of that. Uh, see, you, you disempower women. You know, if you really want to want a woman, you you um, you look at her and you tell her, you know, that she's fat or something like that. You know, things like that. Um, that whole, uh, I forget what that's called, that whole date, that, that whole kind of dating thing where if you really want to be successful with women, you have to, um, you have to verbally abuse them, <laughs> you know, all of that. And so that's coming from, you know, a man who's attracted to that is a man who feels disempowered by women, which means that underneath it on an unconscious level, what they really want is that they absolutely need mommy. Remember that I said that, that what disempowered men really need is mommy. All right, hold on to that, and then we'll read what this guy has to say. So anyway, he says, uh, true masculine is not looking to indulge the fantasies of a spaced out mind, like women are spaced out. He is not interested in what somebody thinks his potential might be. He is already connected to the Shakti who expects nothing from him. And that Shakti is the true seed of masculine power. So he's saying, I already have it within me. I already have feminine within me. I don't need a woman to think anything, which is not what I said. Um, and then he goes on. Now he's going to school me in, in what a woman is. He says, take any woman. All right. So now he's, <laughs> again, I'm talking about the true feminine. I'm not talking about any individual woman talking about the power of the feminine, the source of the feminine. If a woman is uh, evolved, she will present more of the true feminine. But I don't see individual human beings as this. Individual human beings, whether you're a man or a woman, you have a mixture of masculine and feminine within you, and you aren't perfect. So I don't expect this from a physical person. We're talking about... Uh, the forces, the ideals. But he's going to take it down, and now he's going to generalize. So now he's going to say, any woman. So he says, take any woman. Take any woman. All things being equal, she will always, all caps italicized, choose her son over her husband, boyfriend, lover, etc. The moment the sun arrives, all these latter shadows vanish. She is just not interested. Husbands, boyfriends, lovers are just a means. Her true unconscious desire is to birth her son, the only male she truly admires. You'll have to forgive me, but this sounds like projection. I can't help but hear that what is going on inside this person is that he wants his mommy because he really loves the idea that the feminine will discard her husband in favor of her son. And he creates a false choice that doesn't necessarily have to happen. And the choice he creates is that the moment that she gives birth, not to her, <laughs> not to her daughter, but to her son, the moment that she gives birth to her son, she will discard her husband. He says that. And that automatically now she must choose between her son and her husband. I didn't say that. He said that. I'll read it again. Take any woman, all things being equal, she will always choose her son over her husband, boyfriend, lover. Again, why is that even a choice? Why can't you have both? I don't understand. The moment the sun arrives, all these latter shadows, so the husband, the boyfriend, the lover is just a shadow. 
And according to him, he's just a means. So he's nothing more than a sperm bank. What did I say about what is codependence? Codependence is when you are loved for what you do, not for who you are. So according to him, women only love men for being a sperm bank. So it's a very codependent transactional relationship. This is obviously his experience. I don't know where he got this experience. I can only assume he did not get the love that he wanted from his mother. Now, I'm not judging that. I didn't get it from my mother either. But he hasn't become conscious of that. He is now projecting that onto reality. All women only want him for what he can do, which is to provide the sperm so that she can have a son. And the moment that that happens, he's going to be discarded. But that's okay. He's protected himself. How do I know? Because he is already connected to the Shakti within him, and he doesn't care what she thinks. She doesn't care if she needs him or not. He has no need. He is empowered within himself. But as a good man, his job is to be the sperm bank so that she can be provided with her desire. Even though he says in the beginning, the true masculine is not looking to indulge the fantasies of a woman. But he makes it very clear. Her fantasy is to have a son and then make the son her whole world. So he's in, he's, he's in uh, conflict with himself here. Um, all right, the moment the sun arrives, all these latter shadows vanish. She is just not interested. So the moment that she bears a son, she's not interested in her husband anymore. She doesn't love him. She doesn't need him. You know, I guess maybe she needs him to pay the rent or pay the bills or something like that. But, I mean, this is very extreme. And he sees women as being quite narcissistic and abusive. I'm just going off what he's saying here. Let's back up a little bit. This guy is offended at what I'm saying the woman does in her relationship to the masculine. The, an, a self-empowered woman, what turns her on is when she sees a self-empowered man and she wants to reflect to him his highest potential so that he will want to achieve that for his own fulfillment. And that turns her on. I don't see anything negative about that. That's a really wonderful place if you've, been, if you've ever been there. He's saying that a woman seeing your potential is a spaced out fantasy. And that he, he has no interest. He has no need for her. And yet he, because he's so, um, so powerful and doesn't have any needs of his own, doesn't need to be loved, doesn't need to be cherished, because he doesn't need that, he's just going to be the sperm bank, knowing that the moment that she takes his sperm and creates a son, she's going to discard him as a worthless shadow. And that is the definition of codependence. And it's very sad. I, I can't help but imagine that he's been severely hurt by his mother. Whether he's conscious of that or not, I don't know. But that's what I see. Because I never said any of these things. I said that a woman will empower you if she loves you. And he's already assuming that her spaced out fantasies of him is going to disempower him. That she's expecting it of him. That, she, that it's an opinion that she has. And he doesn't care. Here, take my sperm. I'm empowered. I'm going to, out of my graciousness, give you my sperm to create your son. Now go and discard me and go be alone with your son which we could talk about whole Oedipus stuff going on there. Um, now, he's going to talk about uh, mythological uh, teachings here. Uh, he says her... her uh, yeah, I didn't even get this part. I mean, I, don't, I, I can't make this shit up. Um, she is, after she gives birth to her son, she's just not interested. Husbands, boyfriends, lovers are just a means her true unconscious desire is to birth her son, the only male she truly admires. Now, there's a difference between admiring and loving. These are two different things. This is sick. 
I mean, it comes across to me as uh, it, it, it just, it's very inappropriate, Oedipal. So she admires her son. A, a mother shouldn't admi admire her infant son. A mother should love. Now, the one thing that is true that he might be misunderstanding here is that the only true unconditional love in the universe is the love a mother has for her child, not just her son, but her child, whether that's uh, f masculine or feminine. But he's got this whole Oedipal complex thing going on. And he sees that she admires her son. She doesn't love him. She admires him. Admiration is you look up, you, you, you know, you look up towards somebody. So again, this is his projection. This is what he wants from his mom. And it's an Oedipal complex. So he's got, he, so Oedipal complex is a normal thing, at least according to, uh, uh, according to Freud, that um, young sons have an Oedipal complex with their mother. So uh, you can go look up the, the Greek myth of Oedipus, but it's where his, um, where um, a man ends up marrying his mother. So little boys, uh, I remember this. I remember saying this to my mom when I was four years old. I remember saying, I'm going to marry you when I get older. And my mom laughed. But all little boys do this. They have an Oedipal complex. And of course, they grow out of it unless there's a dysfunction. If the mother is not giving enough love to the child, he will be regressed and he will hold on to this fantasy that he's going to marry his mother. So he wants his mom's admiration. So I can only assume he didn't get that. I don't know the guy. I'm only going by what he says. And this is what happens. You come onto my channel and you want to be uh, contrary and you want to start, you know, start shit with me. And, you know, I mean... You're free to have your own opinions, but if you're going to start, you know, firing pot shots at me as I come out, you know, in front of the world and I give my opinion and you feel the need to in the stands, you know, with your, you, you want to take shots at me. I mean, I think it's only fair that I respond. And again, I don't have a problem with people disagreeing with me, but that's not what I'm seeing here. What I'm seeing here is, is a serious uh, denial, serious codependence, somebody who's in denial of how codependent they are. And this guy's fantasy is he wants to marry his mom. And he wants to get rid of the father. Because I think in the Oedipal complex, the guy kills his father and marries his mother. In the Oedipus myth, I mean, he kills his father and marries his mother. So this is his desire. And he knows that if he gives a child to his wife that she's going to want to discard him and that the son is going to want to murder him. And so he, I mean, why anybody would want that? I don't know. Anyway, serious denial, uh, uh, codependent denial here. So again, uh, the moment the son arrives, all these latter shadows vanish. She is not interested. Husbands, boyfriends, lovers are just a means. Her true unconscious desire is to birth her son, the only male she truly admires. The lore of Parvati and Ganesha exemplifies this. Now, let me tell you that, that myth, because it's a beautiful, wonderful myth. This guy's misinterpreting it severely. So in that myth, Shiva, as you know, as we remember, we have to remember the myth from the beginning. Parvati, in her meditations, uh, sees this perfect, beautiful man that she falls in love with. She hasn't even met him. She knows where he is. She's psychically connected to him. He is on top of the Himalayas meditating, deep in meditation. And, and when she goes into her meditation, she sees him. And, and his spiritual power is turns her on and uh, she falls in love with him. And she can't live without him. She yearns for him. And partly this guy is right. That is, without him, she cannot create the world. So her desire is to create the world. That is true. So she, as, I, as you remember the myth, she goes up there, the god of lust comes up, and the blah, blah, blah. And then he sees how much she loves all of creation, 
and she, and that's what get, makes him fall in love with her. He falls in love with her because of how truly and deeply she loves all of creation. And then he's willing to come out of his meditation to be with her, and then the dance of creation uh, comes about, right? So that myth continues. So Shiva, being who he is, he goes off. He goes off to... to uh, to meditate and to be in his uh, power, which is to meditate and be one with the universe. And for him, when he gets lost in meditation, you know, he's Shiva. It could be five minutes or it could be five million years. So this obviously causes uh, distress to Parvati because he disappears and she feels um, unattended to and left alone. So in one of these um, one of these excursions, Shiva goes off to meditate and he's gone for a long time and she gets angry because she's been, she's been left alone. She wants union with him and he's gone in union with himself and with the universe. So she doesn't like that. So, uh, what she does is she, without Shiva, so this is where he doesn't understand the mythology here. So without Shiva, she creates her own son out of the earth, which is her own body. So she takes some earth and she creates a boy and breathes life into him. Now, he is only the child of her. Again, now we're going to see his unconscious fantasy. She, he doesn't have a father. He only has a mother. And so um, she then says, I'm going to go take a bath. I want you to stand in front of the house and guard it. Don't let anybody in, right? So he doesn't have a father. He only has one uh, progenitor, his mother. And so his mother gives him an order. So being the good son, he goes off and does this. Now he is the earth. Ganesha is the earth, extremely powerful being, the power of the earth itself. And so, uh, lo and behold, Shiva comes home. He's done with his meditation and he's coming home and he's coming home to his wife. And he gets home and he sees this boy standing there, very powerful being. And um, he tries to go into his own house and the boy stops him and says, you can't come in. I have to kill anybody that tries to enter this. My mother's in there. She doesn't want to be disturbed. And Shiva says, oh, and he figures out what's happened, that she's created uh, her own son out of the earth. Being Shiva, he, that doesn't faze him, but he understands what's going on. This isn't his son, and he doesn't know who he is. So he tries to tell him very kindly. He says, I'm Shiva. I'm, you know, the Mahadeva. I'm the great God. I've just come back from meditation. Parvati's my wife, and this is my home. Nice to meet you. I'd like to go inside. And Ganesha says, no, you're not coming in. If you come in, I'll, I'm going to have to kill you. So Shiva is taken aback and he uh, doesn't know what he's going to do here. I mean, he, he, he could destroy uh, this boy, but it's his, you know, it's his wife's son that she's created all by herself. And so he's kind of, he doesn't know what to do. I mean, he knows he's going to upset her. He doesn't want to kill, you know, some innocent uh, being. So trying to figure out what's going on. And Vishnu says, hey, Shiva, man, what the hell are you doing? And, he, and Shiva tells him the, the, dy the dynamic, which, of course, Vishnu already understands. And Vishnu says, dude, you are king of the universe. You can't let this go on. It'll create an imbalance. You've got to you've got to take him out. Um, you know this isn't. It, it's it sets a bad example, and again, it, it creates an imbalance in the universe. You got to take him out. So Shiva does. He uh, opens up his third eye and <laughs> fries off the head of Ganesha, and so the 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 headless uh, body of the boy falls to the ground, and of course. Because his body is made of the earth, which is Parvati. Parvati inside screams. She, he, she feels the death of her son. She screams in terror and in rage. And she comes out, you know, dripping wet out of the bathtub. 
and she sees Shiva there and she is so enraged that the universe is on the verge of total destruction. And she tells him, so he very quickly tells her what happened. I couldn't help it. He wouldn't let me in. I blah, 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 blah. Vishnu said, you know, what, I, what am I going to do? She says, you bring him back to life now, mister, or you, you and I are going to be in big trouble. So he goes frantically looking for a head to put on the boy's body. And he finds uh, the head of an elephant that's dying. Takes the head, puts it on the boy, and then... Now you have the elephant-headed boy, Ganesha, and it represents the true merging of Shiva and Shakti. It, it, it represents that true merging. And so now you see Shiva, Parvati, and Ganesha, the, you know, the divine family. He's going to reference that myth, but he doesn't understand it, and you'll see why. I've just explained it to you now. He's, he's going to reference it. He says... Um, uh, again, the moment the sun arrives, all these latter shadows vanish. She's just not interested. Husband, boyfriends, lovers are just a means. Her true unconscious desire is to birth her son, the only male she truly admires. And then he goes on. He's going to educate me. He says, the lore of Parvati and Ganesha exemplifies this. Shakti was so powerful, she did not need a so-called quote unquote husband to birth her son Ganesha. But the patriarchs did not like this. And they made the story where the father whose seed was not needed killed the son because the son did not want a third party. So now he's saying that the myth is, isn't a real myth, that it's not a divinely inspired myth. He's now going to interpret it and say the patriarchy. So in other words, he's, he's making a judgment about the patriarchy, you know, and don't get me wrong, there's, there's a problem with truly patriarchal societies where women are disempowered and treated like, you know, cattle and they don't have any rights. So he's just assuming that the mythology was uh, hijacked and ambushed and changed. So he's, he's presenting that the original myth is that Shakti doesn't need the masculine. She's empowered in herself and she creates her own son. And that's just not what the myth is about. And he, he doesn't realize it, but he shows his self-hatred as a man when he talks about the patriarchy. So he's saying, I'm truly an, a truly enlightened man. I know that my job is to serve the woman and just be a sperm bank for her, knowing that she's going to discard me and have an incestuous desire for her son and get rid of me. Because that's what he's talking about. He's talking about incest. When the mother gives birth to the son and then incestually admires her son, which is incredibly abusive, by the way, that's horrifically abusive to a boy. A boy needs unconditional love. He doesn't need to be admired. It's horrific. So that's incest. So according to him, women are just looking to have an incestual relationship with their own son. And because they need a man to, you know, give birth, then they're going to. So he thinks that he's being spiritual by saying that I understand. I'm not like one of these patriarchs. I understand that women are going to abuse me and toss me aside. I don't care what she thinks. I'm so empowered. I mean, it's, it's very dysfunctional. It's very codependent. Um. And, you know, that Shakti was so powerful, she didn't need a so-called, quote, husband. So he, he derides the role of the husband. That, and that women deride men. You know, that, that there isn't such a thing as the, the true dance of the masculine and the feminine. Um, uh, the son, because the son did not want a third party between him and his mother. Right. And if you read the full myth, that imbalance doesn't survive. It's only after Ganesha actually is the true child of both Ganesha, excuse me, is, is truly the child of Shiva and Shakti. And the elephant represents wisdom represents spiritual wisdom, which is individuation. Individuation says, I don't need anything outside of me. I don't need an external locus of control. I am 
empowered within myself. And the wisdom of that combined with the power of the earth is Ganesha. So that wisdom is Shiva and that power is Shakti. And when the two come together, now we have a good combination. So the myth says very clear that Shakti by herself, if she doesn't engage with the masculine, creates imbalance. The masculine doesn't seek to create only uh, when he wants to uh, empower and balance the world. And, and he does wish to uh, give joy to his wife as well, knowing she does want to create. And so he supports her creation, but he infuses it with his wisdom. That's what the myth is saying. He's saying that, no, the original myth was she didn't need him. And she created her own son, which she admired. And she, she hates her husband, doesn't want him around. He's just this patriarch. I mean, and that's his own projection of himself. That's his own hatred of his own masculinity. But he wants to present himself as he's this, uh, I'm this open, uh, um, evolved male, and I know my place. It's, it's very what's going on right now. It's, it's part of this whole new age cancel culture thing that's going on that, you know, um, where we demean the masculine and, you know, take pot shots at the masculine and all that kind of stuff. And the, in my experience, the you know, so-called new age uh, evolved man who thinks this way is really filled with self-derision. And this shows, again, the lack of balance in the modern time we have between the masculine and the feminine, which you know, we're seeing this in the political right. We're seeing a lot of, of, of response to this and because the, you know, the collective unconscious is trying to balance itself back again. Um, the patriarchs did not like this and made, and they made the story where the father whose seed was not needed killed the son because the son did not want a third party between him and his mother. The patriarchs have absolutely no idea what a mother is. So he's saying that the people who wrote these myths had no idea what was going on. He's going to educate us. He knows more than the people who wrote the mythology. The patriarchs have absolutely no idea what a mother is. A true masculine finds flippant women who cannot command his respect absolutely unbearable. I don't know what that has to do with anything. He's obviously saying that I, whatever I'm describing, he must see as a flippant woman. So this, again, he shows the, the rage that he has towards the idea of being seen and loved unconditionally, which means that he wasn't. So he wasn't seen and loved unconditionally. His mother actually had uh, an incestuous desire to admire him, or at least that's his fantasy. He wants that from his mother. And he's that's unconscious. And of course, he's unaware of that. And so what he does is he, he, he shares his self-directed hatred in this way of a woman who loves you for who you are is flippant. Um, and again, this just shows how incredibly codependent and narcissistic our society is in this guy's comment. Uh, and again, I'm, I, only, I don't know the guy. I only know what I'm reading. And it's not bothering me. I'm not upset. I, I don't get offended when people disagree with me, um, especially in comments. I mean, again, I don't know why you're on my channel. If you have such disdain for what I'm teaching, that I'm, why you even spend the time on my channel, I don't know. Um, I mean, if I didn't like a channel, I'd move on to another one. I wouldn't waste my time writing these giant paragraphs. Uh, let's see. Um, so a true masculine finds flippant women who cannot command his respect absolutely unbearable. He is definitely not going to stand in line with folded hands and beg, please, I want to be with you. So I'm sure I made some reference to if a woman really, you know, is empowered, the masculine will seek that out. And if you really want a man to come, come after you, you know, when you are fully empowered within yourself, you know, men will, you know, like in the old days in the South, you know, when uh, the suitors would come and they'd line the block saying, please marry me. So he's obviously he the idea of a man needing a woman is repulsive to him. 
And that means on an unconscious level, that's where he's at, that he really desperately needs the love and approval of his mom. So much so he wants his mom to admire him incestuously. His need is so great. And so that, of course, is an unbearably painful feeling. So he compensates. This is narcissism. You put out a false uh, perfection of, you know, I don't need anything or anybody. I'm a god. I'm not saying he's a narcissist. We all have narcissism. But that's the narcissistic denial process. I don't need a woman. And to even think that I would get on my knees and ask for a woman. And yet, he's more than happy to volunteer to be a sperm bank and then be discarded while the mother goes off and has an incestuous affair with her son. That's the unconscious. I'm not saying... This is literal. This is unconscious. Uh, this is all the symbolism going on in his unconscious. So this is a guy who's in a lot of pain. He really desperately wants and needs. He's, he's regressed back into either infancy or in, uh, um, in toddlerhood where he wanted to marry his mother. He hasn't gotten past that, which means he didn't get it. Because if you get that from your mother, if, if you get the true love from your mother, then you move past the Oedipal stage. He hasn't. This is, from psychological standpoint, this guy is regressed and he's in his toddler Oedipal stage. He's in love with his mom. He hates his dad and loves his mom and wants to be his mom's husband. Um... So um, he's definitely not going to stand in line with folded hands and beg, please, I want to be with you. Why would he do that when his Shakti, his mother, is in his very consciousness? Again, he's talking about his mom. He's talking about himself. He says, I don't need a woman because me and my mother are having this Oedipal incestuous affair within me. Why do I need external women? External women, I hate them. They're flippant. They disgust me. Uh, his very soul. So his mother is his identity. I, I'm just reading this and seeing it for the first time. Why would he do that when his Shakti, his mother, is in his very consciousness, his very soul? People who view masculine and feminine relationship only as lovers or spouses have got the short end of the stick. They have barely scratched the surface of Shakti. Frankly, they have barely even scratched the surface of what it means to be lovers. So obviously he's talking about me. So obviously I have no idea what uh, this is about. He's going to um, condescendingly and with, with disgust and malice, he's going to put me in my place and tell me how fucked up I am and how I don't know what's going on. And if I really knew what was going on, I would be a sperm bank and fantasize about you know, having an incestuous relationship with my mother. I'm just reading what he put in front of me. I don't know the guy. So I respond and I say, if you're a man, I'm sorry your mother has hurt you so badly you keep attracting such narcissistic women. Because I couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman. And I say, if you're a woman, I'm sorry that men have hurt you so badly that you feel the need to treat men like objects. Maybe some therapy could help. Thanks for watching. So he, of course, has to, ha have to, has to say something. He says, I don't need therapy, man. My mom, and then in parentheses, and dad. Interesting. My mom and dad loved me and did, what, and did what was best so I could live in this world. I never had, quote, dramatic family issues. By the way, I have a happy family, a wife and a son, I have a large extended family of sisters, uncles, aunts, and cousins, second cousins, nephews, nieces, and so on. And forgive me, but that doesn't mean anything. Having a big family doesn't mean anything. Uh, big family, small family, that has nothing to do with the quality or the health of the love in the family. I don't disbelieve you. I mean, I don't necessarily think you have major crazy you know i'm sure your family's perfectly fine i'm sure if i sat down with you guys at thanksgiving i'm sure i'd get along with everybody uh, i i don't know why you need to defend that i said maybe you need some therapy i didn't say anything about you have 
dramatic family issues. I didn't say any of that. I don't know what, you know, I mean, I do I understand, but really people need to understand that therapists are modern shamans. They're modern day shamans. And therapy is good whether you've been in, like me, I went through a lot of really, I did have a lot of dramatic family issues. Um, but, you know, even people who've grown up in normal families have issues. And therapists are not just for nutbag crazy people. I mean, I, I meant that honestly, maybe some therapy. I don't need therapy, man. There's nothing wrong with that. Everybody needs some counseling and some help at some point in their life. Uh, and the fact that you have a big family, I'm really happy for you. Um, but that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean that you're healthy. It doesn't mean that you understand or that even that you were, you know, there's plenty of dysfunction in large families. I'm not saying your family was dysfunctional, but just I don't need therapy. I had a big family growing up doesn't mean anything one way or another. On this earthly plane, I am fine and dandy. You're not fine and dandy. You are filled with rage against men and women both. The only woman you want is your mom, and you want her to admire you. That's not fine and dandy. I mean, the, I mean read what you wrote. The level of, of self-hatred and the level of hatred you have towards the average woman is quite apparent and i can only conclude that you you're on an unconscious level you feel you aren't loved you feel like an object you're a sperm bank but you justify that by saying that's okay me and my mom we have a love affair in my deepest soul and that empowers me and so i don't need external women but i'm happy to to give them my sperm and let them use me and toss me aside I'm not even saying that's what goes on in your family. But in terms of spirituality, you clearly have spiritualized this and you have very strong opinions spiritually, even so that you feel that you have the authority to take mythology and decide what is true mythology and what has been added on by the so-called patriarchs. You know, you don't come up with any historical, uh, you know, uh, uh, credit, you know, um, scholarly understanding of here's what the original myth was and then later it was changed. You don't have that. You have a lot of judgment towards the patriarchy. So you have a lot of hatred towards men. And why, again, going back to your original discomfort was the idea that a woman sees you for who you are and your true potential and empowers you to be that. Why that's so offensive to you that you need to write that whole thing you know, uh, discounting that. To me, this is what, what I'm seeing so far is this pseudo spiritual wannabe hippie guy that, you know, thinks that he loves the feminine when in reality he is co-signing um, a dysfunctional understanding of the masculine, which is, is what we see in a lot of the new agey kind of, you know, hippie man stuff. And a lot of, you know, abusive, there's a lot of things, you know, going on where, you know, um, women want to help men find their, their, you know, their, their soft side, which is, you know, women who have been devalued by, by truly patriarchal men. But because they're not balanced, they want to take out their rage on men and they, you know, they emasculate them. Again, Jada Pinkett Smith, perfect example. She puts in front of the whole world and, uh, you know, emasculating her husband. And he is this guy. He's so codependent. He keeps showing up and allows her to do it. So much so that he loses it and smacks some guy in the face and ruins his entire career in the process. This is the emasculation of the modern awakened male who's really just incredibly codependent and devalued. And that's what I'm hearing here. So um, you've got a big family. Good for you. On this earthly plane, I'm fine and dandy. I'm just telling you what I have observed around me. So we do manifest around us our own internal experience. So we all do it. What happens on the inside is what we see on the outside. It's true that you know, if that is within you, that's what you're going to manifest around you. That's what you're going to experience. 
And I'm telling you what I've experienced. And I've experienced that. I and it, and you know and and it and I've had the other stuff. I've been um, the object. Uh, I, I've been devalued by by women. I married a very devaluing woman. I know what it's like to be that devalued male, where you're there just to perform a function. And um, of course, I had that experience. My mother wanted that experience with me. The one that you describe, uh, the Oedipal experience. My, my mother was furious when I turned five years old. She went from being my best friend to, you know, beating me because I started making friends with other people and having my, started individuating and having my own life. And what my mom wanted was she wanted me to stay a little four-year-old because she did exactly what you described. My mom did that. You know, she had me, she discarded my older brother because he was now, you know, coming up on five years old. He wasn't a little baby anymore. She discarded him and he hates me to this day uh, because of that. And she wanted to create that Oedipal complex with me and I grew out of it and it infuriated her. So I've had the experience that you're talking about. I, based on what I'm reading, you haven't individuated out of that. I don't know anything about your relationship with your wife, whatever. I'm just telling you what I'm reading. And what I'm reading is, at the very least, you've got an unconscious Oedipal connection with your mom, and you have projected that onto the world. And you're saying, I'm just sharing with you my experience. I was sharing my experience. And the need that you had to devalue that, and, and again, it's okay for you to have a contrary opinion, but you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna analyze what I see, and what I see is what I've already explained. So he says, I'm just telling you what I've observed around me and what I myself have come to realize spiritually, and also what I have found from those rare spiritual traditions who worship the divine feminine. I worship the divine feminine, but I find it interesting that you you talk about worshiping the divine feminine, but when a man goes into a worshipful state, you find that disgusting. You say in yourself, a true man would never beg, please be with me, but I'm gonna tell everybody straight up, if I find that kind of feminine power again, that looks at me and I see my true potential being mirrored in her eyes, uh, I will definitely say, I'll get on one knee, I'll get out a ring, and I'll say, please be with me, if, that, if I ever find that again. So you can look down on me and think that I'm weak and that she's flippant if you want, but that's my experience. I, I, again, I don't know anything about your, maybe you've got a great relationship, I don't know, and this is just something inside of you, I don't know. I'm not trying to judge what you've got. I'm glad that you have a wife and kids, and I'm sure you guys are wonderful people. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, um, I also have found from those rare spiritual traditions who worship the divine feminine, all things being equal, a woman will always, he again, he repeats himself, a woman will always, all caps italicized, choose her son over any other man. But again, why does she have to? She doesn't have to. This is the thing that, the, you know, why this necessary thing has to happen in your mind, that the moment that she gives birth to a son, again, you don't mention daughters. Does that mean she discards her daughters? I mean, there's just something's really out of balance here, man. Um, and why does she have to choose? You've been in, you know, you've been in a family, big family, loving family. And the reality is, is that that's not what happens. There becomes a unity. And again, if we're talking about the myth of Parvati and Shiva and Ganesha, they create a family unit. And we see it. You go into Hindu uh, houses today and you'll see pictures of this happy family of Shiva and Parvati and Ganesha all sitting together smiling. Why in your reality you have to see this? I don't know. What are people doing? It looks like I've got uh, visitors here. Anyway, anyway, so um, I'm going to have to to shut this off pretty quick. But I mean, you see this fairly. You understand what I'm saying here. Uh, this this represents. I could finish the quote, but I'm not going to. This represents 
a misunderstanding. And again, you know, I, I would recommend this guy could do with some therapy. Anyway, I got to go. I've said plenty as it is, but uh, there you go. I wish you guys all the best. I will see you all very soon. Take back your soul. This is another transmission from Mahadeva here at ThunderWizard.com headquarters where you find the world's only unified spiritual energy system at ThunderWizard.com. Get ready because here I come.